Hi. What I have here on the bench today is a Keithley 775A programmable counter from the 1980s. I bought it on eBay recently. And in one of my previous videos, I did a teardown and repair of a Recodana 1992 frequency counter, which I'll put link below the description for those who are interested. Anyway, if you look at the specifications for these two counters, they're actually very similar in terms of frequency ranges, sensitivities, and accuracy. For example, here is a, the specifications for the Recodana 1992, and as you can see for the three channel versions, which is the version I have, we have two channels, both can handle from DC, one is up to 160 MHz, the other one is up to 100 MHz. And then we have the third channel, which is the higher frequency channel. For the Recodana, you can have uh, from 40 MHz to 1.3 GHz. And if you look at the specifications for the Keithley 770, uh, 775A, then you will see that we also have two lower range channels from 0 to 120 megahertz and uh, the third channel is from uh, where is it okay here we go it's from 50 megahertz to 1.3 gigahertz and if you look at the details of the uh, data sheet which i'm not going to bore you with uh, you will see that uh, the specification for the record data is ever so slightly better than the specifications for the uh, keithley 775 by 8 nevertheless they're quite comparable so i wonder if they were meant to be competing products back then, as both were in the same market, um, in the market at the same period of time. And uh, as you can tell that I'm a big fan of this Keithley test instrument, and I have quite a few on my shelf. I have the Keithley 196, 197 bench multimeters and uh, the Keithley 614 electrometer. Anyway, Keithley had been acquired by Tektronix for some years now, and uh, their equipment remains very popular in the second-hand market. So after I got this meter, I wanted to power it up, but uh, then I decided not to because uh, you can hear that... Uh, I'm not sure you can hear this. Uh, if you yeah, just uh, tilt it around, you will hear that there's some rattling inside, and I don't believe it's uh, something major, but I do want to open it up first to take a look, make sure that those are not from a metal screw or something, because uh, if that shorts out the circuit, that could uh, easily uh, turn this into another major repair video. But uh, Keithley liked this kind of construction with uh, this kind of a brown, plasticky uh, box back then. In fact, that's how most of their instruments are, were made. So, for example, those are the uh, uh, 196 and the 614 out there on the shelf. They're made of the similar construction. And uh, so, uh, from the case itself, it, it wasn't as attractive as the Recodana. 1992, as I uh, did a teardown with last time, which I'll show you, it's uh, right up there. And uh, so anyway, so I'm going to have to take this uh, uh, apart and first show you what it looks like inside. And, and after we uh, get rid of that rattling noise, we can turn it on and uh, take a look at its performance. And now I have just removed the two screws at the back. I should be able to lift the cover up. And you notice there's some sticky things on top. That's probably uh, what uh, when, when it was in service, there was a, a sticker on top, and we can clean up that later. But uh, right now, let's uh, open it up and take a look. So here it's uh, what ins what is inside. And uh, before I zoom in and show you the components here, I just want to show you the uh, the top cover here. Actually, it's a uh, inside has a aluminum shielding, and uh, so which is necessary. And you can see that. Uh, on the side of the uh, of the case here, we have these kind of tabs so that we can make sure that they make contact with the uh, shielding uh, in the upper half shelf, so that uh, to make a good shielding here. And the first thing I want to see is what it was making that rattling noise. I think I already know. Um, as you can see, we have quite a few of these standoffs, and uh, this one is missing. So I wonder if that was the one that was making the noise. And it was actually quite common for these kind of uh, older uh, plasticky uh, case as over the years they became really brittle and that's one of the drawbacks of these kind of cases versus metal cases. But uh, let me see if I can uh, get that thing out. So 
I can still hear it. And uh, I'm not sure where was it tucked under. So let me fish that thing out and uh, I'll show you. Give me a moment. And as it turned out, that rattling noise is indeed uh, a screw. And so I'm glad that I opened it up and uh, took it out first. So that screw probably was from this corner of the standoff. As you can see that we do have these uh, screws tightening the uh, the bottom board down. So this one clearly was somehow over the years that uh, it cracked. Possibly it cracked actually. And then uh, this one just came loose. So anyway, so with that uh, out of the way, let's uh, take a closer look at what we can see in this uh, Keith Lee 775A. And now we can see the inside of this Keith Lee 775A. And uh, it does look a little bit barren, especially compared to the uh, Dana 1992 uh, frequency counter I did a tear down with last time. If I remember correctly, that frequency counter had two PCB. So one on the top and the other at the bottom, so both are populated. And this one, you know, if you take a look at uh, the how uh, big the space is, and pretty much the whole area is actually just occupied by empty space. Anyway, so as we can see here, uh, towards this corner, we have the linear regulators, and these instruments were um, very typically are powered by linear regulators rather than the switching regulators. And here we have two, just by the look of it, uh, three terminal regulators, possibly for the uh, plus and the minus rail. And uh, one thing interesting is that uh, this regulator, uh, they share a single heat sink, but the heat sink is actually two pieces. There's a one piece here and another one is just a bolted on uh, secondary heat sink. So my guess is that originally when they uh, designed it, it calls for a bigger heat sink, but instead of designing a separate one and manufacturing a separate one, they just found it to be more convenient to use uh, off the shelf components with one heat sink here and uh, bolt on another piece. There's nothing wrong with that. Anyway, so um, here, next to the regulator, we have a uh, riser board, and this is actually the option for this uh, 775A. This is the uh, temperature compensated uh, crystal oscillator. It's not a uh, full organized oscillator like the, the Recodena frequency counter we did tear down with last time. But um, this is more precise than your standard uh, uh, crystal oscillator nevertheless. And this one sits on the riser board. So let me take it, uh, uh, let me try to take it off and show you guys. Let me just be gentle here, okay. Actually, it's pretty easy to take off. So now we can see that uh, this coax is, uh, com is actually uh, connected to this two uh, BNC connectors. And just by the look of it, uh, this one switches uh, from internal and external. So presumably uh, it takes a external reference and also we can use the uh, the switch to switch the internal. So this is uh, all done manually. And uh, and there's really not too much on this uh, board. So let me put it back. And this one is actually not that easy to uh, align correctly because the pins and uh, um, because of those uh, the headers, uh, you can easily plug in wrong anyway. So now here we have this metal shielded area, which we will take a look at later. And uh, so now let, let's take a look at the front portion of the uh, circuitry. I'm, I'm going to zoom it in a little bit so that you can see it more clearly. So towards this end, and uh, as you can see here, we have a um, Intel AD231A. So this is actually a microprocessor and just by the proximity of this processor to the GPIB uh, I.O. Uh, I'm thinking that this one is actually responsible for uh, driving the GPI, uh, GPIB. And uh, so some modern instruments actually have a dedicated GPIO chip, but this one just uses a microprocessor instead. And here we have this uh, 2 LS uh, 7061. So these are actually 16-bit uh, counters. So 
I'm not sure exactly what they do, but uh, given that this is a um, frequency counter, it is uh, not surprising that we found these chips in here. And uh, moving to the right, and uh, let me just move it a little bit. Then we have this uh, EEPROM, which uh, stores the uh, execute, uh, stores the program feeding into the uh, microprocessor here. Now, the microprocessor used here is uh, AD31, which is an Intel 8051 microcomputer. And then we have this chip, uh, which is a 8279. It's a programmable, uh, it's a programmable keyboard and display interface driver. So that pretty much uh, covers all the chips uh, on this side of the board. And uh, remember, this is uh, uh, the one that we have an option of a up to 1.3 gigahertz. So that's why we have this riser board here. And this one is responsible for that uh, channel C, which uh, uh, has higher frequency than the other two channels. And uh, so this one, if you look, uh, if, I'm not sure you can see this side, we can see that uh, there's some uh, high frequency, I believe these are some high frequency transistors. Interestingly enough though, this board is not shielded and uh, which probably does limit, does cause some uh, interference but uh, the interference might just be uh, small enough that uh, didn't need to have this in a metal enclosure. Now on the, uh, the record in teardown, well, if you recall that all those uh, uh, front end channels are actually shielded in its own metal can, but uh, this one, it apparently did not. So back here we also have this a section that is totally uh, shielded uh, by this aluminum cover. Now I'm looking at this, I do see a missing screw here too as well. I'm not sure if this uh, screw was, uh, when they serviced this earlier, it just removed and forgot to put it back or what. But uh, I don't believe uh, there's another missing screw. I mean, I don't believe I, I heard it before uh, from the rattling sound because that one was actually a screw from for the, uh, the board mount at the other side. So anyway, so let me uh, remove the uh, this shielding and we'll see what is uh, underneath. And uh, I don't want to lose the washer here. So later on, when I put it back, I'll remember to uh, find another screw. And I think the front end probably is more important than the screw at the back here, if I couldn't find a replacement screw. But uh, these, by the look of it, are pretty standard screws. And with the screws removed, I should be able to just, uh, oh, okay, so it's actually not a, uh, a uh, shielding box is just a piece of uh, aluminum and uh, board on top. This is actually quite interesting uh, when you look at the uh, the board here. What jumps out at me are these uh, are the boards here, and this looks like a riser board here, uh, not riser board, but it's a daughter board plugged into the uh, main board. And look at the wires flying uh, off this. Uh, board and some goes to up here and there are quite a few goes to the resistors uh, not sure if you can see the resistors here but it ended up uh, oh sorry ended up here here's one and uh, here's another one very interesting I wonder why they uh, were doing that because these are actually just uh, um, 10102 so those are actually two input NOR gates so there's nothing too special about those I wonder why they did it this way um, not really sure by the look of it though it seems that we originally have a U38 uh, this is actually one chip here but for some reason we needed two here and uh, I don't know if this is a professional bodge or it's simply uh, some other considerations going on here. Not entirely sure. Anyway, so if I just move this a little bit, then we can see the front end here again. Uh, these were not individually uh, 
shielded. And uh, these two channels are identical. From the specifications, we saw that both are able to operate up to 100, I think it's 130 megahertz. And so these are exactly identical channels. Anyway, so now we have pretty much seen the, uh, the inside of this uh, frequency counter. I think it's time for me to put it back and power it up to see what, to see how accurate it is. Okay, so I just uh, put the shielding cover back on and uh, also I had the unit plugged in. I'm ready to power it up. I deliberately left the uh, top cover off as I got a feeling we might need to adjust the TCXO uh, once we started measuring the frequency and uh, started verifying the performance. By the way, I forgot to mention earlier, the Keithley 775A utilizes something called the reciprocal counting method. I think I explained it in my Record Dana 1992 teardown video before, but um, I just wanted to mention it briefly here again. So to measure the incoming pulse frequency, we can use at least a couple methods. The most intuitive way for measuring the pulse frequency is to set a gate time, say one second, and count how many pulses had passed through the gate during this time interval. The obvious drawback is that the frequency resolution is directly correlated with the gate time. So for a gate time of one second, uh, the maximum resolution you get is one hertz. And an alternative method is to use two counters. One is the vent counter, which measures the number of incoming pulses, and the other counter is to measure the number of pulses from the reference counter, which is derived from the highly stable crystal reference. And uh, then give, for a given gate time, you can calculate the measured frequency using the values from these two counters. And this is the so-called reciprocal counting method, and it allows for greater accuracy and allows for shorter gate time. Okay, so let me power it on. And we see that it does some uh, power on self-check, and now we are in business. And the first thing I wanted to do is check how accurate the frequency measurement is. And for that, I'm using my rubidium frequency standard. And I powered that on earlier. As you can see that right now we uh, have achieved the lock. Uh, is to the uh, upper left corner of the screen. And uh, so that one should give us a pretty accurate and uh, 10 megahertz signal. And so we want to use that as a standard to see how accurate our frequency counter is. And now I'm going to put that into channel A. And the measured frequency is 9.998. Well, it's pretty close to 10 megahertz, but I think we can improve it a little bit uh, later on by adjusting the, uh, the TCXO uh, adjustment. So let's move on to channel 2 and see if channel 2 works. And so I think this is channel B. To measure that, it's pretty self-explanatory. As you can see that we have this uh, uh, button to switch between A and B. Yep, and it's measuring, uh, giving a similar result, which is uh, make, make sense because the front end and everything is uh, exactly identical between the two channels. So now we can see that uh, this one is a little bit off. So before we do anything else, let me see if we can uh, adjust it to make it a 10 megahertz bang on again. And for that, I'm just going to uh, loosen the screw here. This is an adjustment screw. And because we're live, I don't want to this accidentally fall in, so I'm going to hold it here. And inside, we have this uh, adjustment uh, uh, screw, actually. And uh, yes, in my uh, last video when I did this adjustment, people were saying that, well, you could use a uh, oscilloscope and comparing the phase of the reference signal and uh, the actual output. Yes, that will give you a more accurate reading. But for this adjustment, let's just take a look at how uh, close we can get just by adjusting this uh, right here. And... Uh, so this would definitely give you within uh, one hertz accuracy. And wow, I have to adjust quite a bit for it to uh, um, go up. And it appears that we are actually achieving the... Uh, so this is the highest I can go, because the other direction I go, if you see that, it actually goes lower. Um, not sure if you can see this. 
or it's just not doing anything here at all. I don't know. So it doesn't seem that we're doing much here and uh, it doesn't seem like whichever way we we adjust the screw here. So that's very interesting. So we may need to uh, take a look at that OCXO and not OCXO, sorry, that uh, TCXO to see if there's any uh, anything else going on. But right now it seems that uh, we can't adjust it that much. And uh, so that is interesting. It seems that uh, I the, the adjustment screw is not doing too much here. So I wonder if uh, this thing is either, well, not defective, but uh, the adjustment circuitry probably has some issue here. So we can certainly investigate that uh, in a later video. But for now, uh, I would call the 9.98 uh, uh, close enough. So yes, after some tinkering, I think the best I can do right now is uh, to make it 9.9981 instead of the 9.980 uh, so clearly that's still not uh, uh, ideal but uh, for now I will call it okay and uh, we will move on to our next measurement so for our second uh, test I'm going to use this HP 8642B uh, signal generator which is the one humming in the background here and that one currently is setting to uh, 100 megahertz and minus 10 dBm. So we're going to use that to uh, trigger the uh, channel C to see if it works. And it's showing 99.98. Uh, so again, the measurement is a little bit lower and as uh, so we uh, saw earlier. And uh, so it looks like it's working. So let's increase the uh, frequency. Let's uh, ch turn it directly to 1 gig and with the same minus 1 uh, minus 10 rather dBm signal. So now this is a 1 gig and as you can see that we're measuring uh, pretty much close to 1 gigahertz. So let's increase it a little bit to uh, 1.3 gigahertz which is the upper limit that this unit is capable of. So let's do 1.3 gigahertz and uh, we are not seeing anything. Uh, let's uh, lower it. Uh, let's increase the uh, the power a little bit. So the amplitude, let's do 0 dBm. So as you can see that we are able to measure uh, 1.3 gigahertz, it's just not at minus 10 dBm. So and um, as far as the uh, the performance is concerned, I think it's, uh, it's working properly. Now let's increase the frequency to see uh, if we can uh, get it to measure higher. So right now it's 1.3 gigahertz and I'm going to increase gradually. So now it's uh, let's do 1.35 not sure if you no uh, 1.31 okay so looks like actually the tolerance is pretty low because uh, 1.35 doesn't look like it's working correctly so 1.3, that's uh, as what is specified, that's the maximum we are able to measure. And uh, so anyway, so I think that's pretty much all I wanted to cover. Of course, there are a lot of uh, different functions you can do with uh, different frequencies. You can do arithmetic between the uh, channel A and channel B, and you can change the gate time and uh, everything um, that uh, you expect from a programmable counter and timer but uh, that's uh, not what I wanted to cover for this video. Anyway, so I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new. And uh, if you like the video, please give it a big thumbs up and uh, remember to subscribe, share, and I will catch up with you next time.